Federal regulated militia be necessary to the security of a free state. The right of the people to keep and bear arms shall not be infringed. Welcome to another edition of Bearing Arms, Cam and Company. My name is Cam Edwards. It is great to have you with us today. Uh, it is good to be back after a uh, week away. Hope that uh, you were able to uh, to make it. I did have a couple of folks ask, what happened to the podcast? I just, I just took a vacation, a staycation, if you will. Didn't go anywhere. One day, we went uh, to a local winery. I, I, I was able to take Miss E out for a, uh, a brief uh, vacation for an afternoon, and she had a good time. Coming up on the uh, program today, we're going to talk with our friend Selena Zito from the Washington Examiner about uh, all of the new gun owners around the country. There are a lot of them, uh, and what type of impact those gun owners might actually have on the uh, 2020 election. I think that they will have an impact. I think there's a lot of stuff going on right now, frankly. I mean, we've got the uh, continued violence. It was another violent night in Chicago. Uh, more than 100 people arrested, hundreds of people taken to the downtown area, uh, smashing windows, stealing stuff, uh, supposedly in response to an officer-involved shooting uh, there in Chicago. Although i got to tell you, that's a weird response to an officer-involved shooting, right? Uh, somebody shot an officer, officer shot back. Let's go bust up an Apple store. Doesn't make a whole lot of sense to me, and I don't think it has much to do, quite frankly, with that uh, specific incident. This is uh, just another uh, example of what Democrat mayors are allowing to happen uh, in their deep blue Democrat-controlled city. Mayor Lori Lightfoot has been complaining for weeks now about uh, the possibility of federal law enforcement coming in to uh, help quell the violence there, calling uh, President Trump's uh, a, a plan to do so, all kinds of uh, bad names. Uh, and here we have another example of uh, Mayor Lightfoot not able to keep the streets uh, in her city. That, too, is going to have an impact on the 2020 election. It's also one of the reasons why so many Americans are buying firearms for the very first time. Record number of gun sales taking place over the last few months, in large part because Americans are rightfully concerned about the unrest that they see playing out on the streets of their city. So let's talk about it with Selena Zito of the Washington Examiner, find out what uh, uh, she has to say and what uh, the folks that she's been talking to around the country have to say as well. Take a look and a listen. Selena, thank you so much for coming to the program. It's great talking with you today. Always amazing to be with you. Are you kidding me? Thanks for having me. Uh, it is my pleasure. Uh, and listen, I love it when you're writing about guns as well, because that makes... You know, gives us the opportunity to spend some time together. And you were recently at, uh, was this, the Smoking Guns Shop in uh, Oakmont, Pennsylvania, right? Is that, is that Western PA? It's Western PA. It's, um, uh, if you were like trying to stereotype the, uh, the town, it's sort of like a cross between a middle class suburb to very wealthy suburb. Um, and so it's, it's not where sort of you would expect to see perhaps this gun shop, yet it's so perfect. It's like the most perfect gun shop I've ever been to. <laughs> now, how was the inventory when you were there? Did they actually have anything available for sale? And they do. They do. Not much. <laughs> because, as you know, it's hard to buy guns right now, and it's hard to buy ammo. Um, but... You know, it, 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 what I think is so sort of fascinating about this story is is people understanding that new the new gun sales have crossed all sort of sort of stereotypical banners. They're older, they're um, younger, they're whiter, they're blacker. They're everyone is going to buy guns, and it began. In February, end of February, beginning of March, uh, when COVID first came out, but then it like quadrupled in June and July when the riots started, and uh, you know it, it it it's really been sort of a fascinating phenomena for um for not just this gun shop. I went to a bunch of different ones, but I mean this one does have cigars. <laughs> and also double espressos, and half of everyone there is Italian, so I felt like I was at my family's house for Sunday dinner, and also guns. Um, and, and so it's just this real sense of community and belonging um, when, you, when you walk inside the door. 
you know, which is interesting because, as you say, we've got so many Americans who are buying guns for the first time who who don't fit into the stereotype yeah. of, you know, the uh, middle-aged white guy uh, who lives in a rural area. And I realize I'm describing myself here. But, um, you know, we, we've got <laughs> – but but the thing is, like, there is no stereotypical gun owner anymore. There's no – I don't no. think there's even such a thing as a non-traditional gun owner. I think there are just gun owners uh, because that's what we're seeing here. As you say, this broad cross-section of American society – I think Americans, rightfully so, are worried about their personal safety. They see the unrest in the streets. They see the in, inability or the unwillingness of a lot of these mayors to actually address this. And, and whether it's the you know, you know the politically motivated violence or the fact that in you know New York shootings have nearly doubled. Uh, they've nearly doubled in Philadelphia. Shootings are up in Baltimore, Chicago, Portland, Oregon, Los Angeles, California. You know, people are are, are genuinely concerned for their public safety, and I, I I'm, I'm right there with them, quite frankly. Yes, they're concerned about their treasure, which means themselves and their families. They're also concerned about their personal property, whether it is protecting their home or protecting their business or protecting their family business. Uh, and, uh, and I think actually it's very healthy for, um, for there to be a great cross section of people buying guns. I think it's healthy for the Second Amendment and preserving the Second Amendment. It's crossing um, political parties as well, and it's maybe making people rethink their values um, as things such as personal property are now considered racist to own them and or protect them. But also you see, um, in particular uh, among the elderly, and, I, and, and that's a broad group, right? Uh, but let's just say people 60 plus and older. Mm-hmm. Uh, and, and, but also among, um, African American families. Uh, you know, one of the <laughs> misnomers, um, that my profession gets wrong is they don't understand how important in, within the black community, especially within the rural black community of gun ownership and, but also being trained in understanding how to use a firearm. You know, often these homes are miles from their closest neighbor, and it's not just about protecting their property, but it's also about protecting their families against, you know, animals, wild animals, uh, but it's also living off of the land, hunting and and, and what, fishing, which we don't use guns for fishing, at least the last time I checked, <laughs> um, but, but that sort of self-sustaining um, attitude is very prevalent around among more rural and ex-urban America. Absolutely. And no, you don't need a gun to go fishing, but you can use one if you want. Okay. Uh, depending <laughs> on, you know, you, you, you're going to want a uh, fish of a certain size, otherwise there's not going to be much left to eat. But uh, no, I, I, I think you're absolutely right. I mean, I see that where I am in, in rural Virginia, um, you know, first of all, I mean, if you if you go to – uh, the local country store that's the the check-in station uh, first day of deer season. I mean, again, you will see, uh, you know, black hunters, white hunters, uh, father, yeah. sons, you know, th- multiple generations. I mean, it's just, it's what people do around here. But, you know, also getting back to those older Americans, one of the things that uh, a friend of mine who works at a local gun shop here in Farmville has said is that they're seeing a lot of uh, older women, um, widows in particular, who are coming in with their kids and they're, they're telling, you know, uh, the, the uh, employees there, I, I just don't feel safe by myself. Um, I want something, you know, that I can use to, to protect myself. And they're primarily looking at handguns. Uh, shotguns uh, have become more popular as the uh, as supply of, of uh, handguns has kind of dissipated a little bit. But, uh, you know, th- that is a, a real phenomenon that you just talked about that we're seeing here in Farmville as well. So I guess the next question, Selena, is – what kind of impact do you think these new gun owners might have on the election in November? So the prevailing wisdom right now is that Biden is going to win, right? If you if you look at the polling numbers um, uh, coming out of polls everywhere, uh, it shows him with, with with him with a commanding lead. Um, but I think, to be honest, that people aren't really paying attention in the way that maybe you and I pay attention to politics, right? They're more concerned about, am I going to go to school? Am I going to go to school? Am I, do I have to get a new computer for my other kids? What about football? What about soccer? What am I, you know, can I ever go back to church? Like, there are so many more important things right now, and they're real, people 
people are really getting impacted by local politics, for the most part, in a very negative way. And so I think these things are going to be sort of like making a cake, right? Mm -hmm. Um, When you first start, the bowl is empty, but then you start adding all these different ingredients, and all of a sudden you're like, oh, wait a minute. Um, Yeah, I thought this side was the guy that I wanted, but turns out when I put this together, it's actually tough that I want. That's what my ingredients tell me. That's so I feel like because I always have to bring everything back to food. That's who I am. Um, I, I think that um, I think this is it is not settled right now. And things like protecting the Second Amendment, things like the ability to go and you know a first time home, um, a first time gun owner, right? They go in to buy the gun first, and they, and they realize, oh, wait, this is not like this crazy place that I thought it was going to be. Okay, it's not safe. And wait, this there is a process. I don't get to just buy it and there's loopholes and I can walk walk out. There's actually a, a lot of paperwork I have to fill out. Um, there's a lot of identification I have to provide. This is not the you know uh, drive up McDonald's. Um, point of view that the press is popping. And wait a minute, they're teaching me, they're telling me I need to go to um, uh, a, a, someone to train me. Here's where I go to practice. Here's where a gun club is. You know, all of a sudden they're understanding that this is a very responsible sport. And this is a very responsible way to protect yourself. And that personal empowerment, like I cannot stress this enough, that personal empowerment and individualism starts to take hold in how they view other things. And so in that aspect, I think that this benefits Republicans. Interesting. You, you know, I was actually having this conversation uh, earlier today when I was uh, sitting in for uh, David Webb on Sirius X and Patriot. The, the idea that, that government is the answer for everything. Uh, you know, used to be found exclusively, I think, on the left. Now, I think you can find that on the right. And it's just a matter of, you know, well, which which which, which party is going to be the one to propose a government solution uh, to whatever problem, you know, exists under the sun? And as you just talked about, I mean, beyond that political debate, there is that very fundamental uh, discussion about, you know, should you not only have the right to protect yourself, uh, but should you avail yourself of, of that right? Should you take responsibility uh, for your own safety and your own security? And, you know, look, when, when crime is low and neighborhoods are safe, uh, maybe that's a, a, a conversation that most people or many people choose not to have, right? They think to themselves, ah, I don't need a gun. Everything's fine. But now, as you say, a lot of those people are having this conversation for the very first time in their life. And they're thinking to themselves, well, you know what? You know, when my neighbor's car got broken into last week, it took two hours for the police to show up, or, or maybe they didn't show up at all. Maybe they just said, yeah, you know, it's a nonviolent crime, uh, fill out a report, and, and we'll see, you know, what we can do. But you're right. I, I think that, that, that people are now thinking about, many Americans are now thinking about their personal safety, the safety of their family, in a way that uh, that they weren't even six months ago, even at the at the beginning of the lockdowns in March. Uh, and, and, and given the, you know, again, either the inability or the unwillingness, uh, of some of these elected officials in, in cities around the country to actually address what's going on, uh, I, I think that more Americans are going to have this conversation in, in the months ahead. And I, I, I would love it if this actually prompted a, uh, a, a larger discussion about, you know, the limits of, of government intervention and the limits of, of government action in terms of being able to solve each and every one of our problems, because, you know, some of it really is up to us when we talk about mask mandates or, or or even the ability to defend yourself from an intruder at two o'clock in the morning. You know, the government can only do so much. Some of it is 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 ultimately left up to uh, us as individuals to to take care of ourselves and to take care of the people that we love. Absolutely. And so what I think that um, what we don't understand uh, that's not being caught up in polling and or in interviews. First of all, people just don't want to tell you how they feel about something because of, of the uh, prospect of possibly being canceled or their job being canceled or their family being impacted. But there, there is um, something very intoxicating about um, empowerment, the empowerment and the ability to protect yourself and your family. 
Uh, and, 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 and it makes you think, it starts the snowball effect about personal responsibility, about individualism, and about the role of government. And then it makes you think, well, let me think about the role of my local government in this pandemic. Well, it's pretty much been crappy. Uh, why do I want more of that? Maybe I don't. I might not be a Republican, I might not be a Democrat, but I know I'm someone, just speaking, you know, um, anecdotally, but, you know, someone where I think, well, I might not think I'm part of this tribe or that tribe, but I know I'm part of the I don't want more government tribe. Mm-hmm. And I think that that's, the, I think people are thinking about it as each time they're more impacted by the government saying, you can't do this, you can't do that, you can't do this, you can't do that. All of a sudden, people are like, whoa, <laughs> back off. Yeah. And it all starts with the Second Amendment. Why it's, one of those, why it's the most important one. It really is. I mean, you know, the, the second and the first, uh, and both are certainly under threat right now. Um, again, S- Selena's piece, the economy is struggling, but gun sales are soaring. Uh, you can find that at the Washington Examiner. But honestly, just go to selenazito.com. Uh, and that way you can find all of Selena's latest columns and writings. You can sign up for her weekly newsletter, uh, which is absolutely fantastic. Uh, SelenaZito.com. Is that right, Selena? That's right. And my emails are free. They're fun. They're not fattening. And I take you all across the country. A lot of my, I would say the bulk of my stories are more about culture. And in culture, you can find out where we are going in Politics. Absolutely. Dispatches from the middle of somewhere. The last time Selena yelled at me is when I said that I live in the middle of nowhere. Oh, you cannot say that. I know. You can absolutely <laughs> say that. America, every square inch in this country is the middle of somewhere. Yes. And I'm in the middle of somewhere. I'm actually not too far from the geographic center of the state of Virginia. So I am in the middle of somewhere. Uh, S- Selena, <laughs> it is always so good talking with you. Thank you for spending some time with us today. Oh, my gosh. Anytime. I always love talking with you. Oh, me too. We'll do it again very, very soon. Uh, Selena Zito, the Washington Examiner, join us here on Varian Arms, Cam & Company. All right, I appreciate Selena dropping by and spending some time with us today. Let's get to today's uh, Armed Citizen story, our good deed of the day, and our recidivist report as well. In fact, we will uh, start there, as we always do. A uh, story out of Wisconsin where uh, more than 50 cars broken into seven people in custody in uh, West Allis, Wisconsin. One of those taken into custody, an individual who has uh, been well-known to law enforcement for a, a considerable period of time, according to a uh, West Allis police. Uh, this was uh, evening Saturday, August the 8th, early morning hours of Sunday, August the 9th. Uh, 50 car break-ins, over 50 car break-ins, five suspects taken into custody, four juveniles, one adult, uh, all residents of Milwaukee, Wisconsin. The adult, according to police, uh, an adult who is on probation for armed robbery. Yeah, how about that? According to police, uh, New Berlin, Wisconsin police, uh, took two additional suspects into custody following a vehicle pursuit. Both of those suspects, uh, adult residents of Milwaukee, Wisconsin as well. Uh, police not yet sure if the two groups of subjects are actually related uh, according to the West Dallas police, the uh, incident is going to be presented to the Milwaukee County DA's office. The uh, New Berlin incident will be pre- uh, presented to the Waukesha County DA's office. So we uh, don't have a lot of details yet, but we do know that uh, at least one of those uh, individuals known to law enforcement, again, on probation for armed robbery at the time, I suppose we should be thankful that it was only 50 car break-ins that this individual is now connected to or believed to be connected to as opposed to an actual armed robbery. But I'm guessing if you're uh, the owner of one of those 50 cars, you're probably not too thankful. You're probably wondering why the hell wasn't this guy still behind bars for his crime. Uh, Our Armed Citizen Story of the Day from Brandon, Florida. WFLA reporting on a woman who shot and killed an armed intruder in a gunfight. Yeah, the sheriff's office there got a 911 call about 4.30 Sunday morning regarding shots fired at the Woodbury Woods Apartments. When deputies arrived on scene, they found a individual deceased in the doorway of uh, one of the apartment units there. According to the sheriff's office, an argument had uh, begun after the man started knocking on the door of this apartment just after 4.30 in the morning. The woman inside the home could not see who it was, but cracked open the door, and that's when the guy pushed himself inside. 
An argument ensued between the two. The intruder began confronting a man who was also in the apartment. The intruder then shot that apartment dweller in the lower part of his body. In fear for her life, detective said the woman fled to a bedroom, grabbed a gun, returned to the living room where another argument ensued. Almost immediately, an exchange of gunfire uh, between that armed suspect and the woman. Woman shot and killed a man later found by deputies in the doorway of the apartment. Uh, according to Sheriff Chad Cronister, quote, we believe the decedent and the woman involved in the shooting knew each other, uh, still investigating the events that led up to this incident. However, it does appear to be domestic in nature. So we are awaiting more details. But again, somebody comes into your home where they don't have a right to be and they start firing a shot. Guess what? You've got the right to protect and defend your life. So we'll uh, look for any updates out of that story in uh, Brandon, Florida, as they become available. Uh, finally, today, our good deed of the day from Lake Winnipesaukee. Where is that? Is that New Hampshire or is that Massachusetts? I think that's Massachusetts. An off-duty police officer saved a pilot who uh, crashed in to Lake Winnipesaukee. No, I take it back. New Hampshire. Uh, Stoneham police officer Joe Ponzo was off-duty, actually on a, a family vacation at Lake Winnipesaukee. This was uh, Sunday afternoon. Ponzo saw this uh, ultralight glider plane crash into the lake. He called the New Hampshire State Police Marine Patrol Unit, told him, hey, this is what just happened here. And then he uh, rushed in his boat to the scene. He and other boaters actually worked to pull the pilot out of the water. The uh, pilot identified as 70-year-old David Grapes, conscious and alert. The uh, plane had sunk in about 65 feet of water. Ponzo said, uh, quote, thankfully, we were in the right place at the right time. The plane sank into the water right after the crash. The man was able to get himself out before we got there. He was in the water, and a, a few other boaters came to help me get him on my boat. Yeah, Stoneham Police Captain, uh, Police Chief, rather, James McIntyre, says, even off duty, on vacation with our families, we are never truly off the job when duty calls. Officer Ponzo is a 23-year veteran of the Stoneham Police Department, and he was the right person to be there when this man needed help. So there you go. Absolutely in the right place at the right time, willing and able to do the right thing. Officer Ponzo, we certainly appreciate your very good deed. That is going to do it for this edition of Bearing Arms Cam and Company. I want to thank you for being a part of the program today. We will be back tomorrow. Now, the uh, shows might be going up a little bit later in the afternoon than they normally do. Uh, I'm sitting in for David Webb on Sirius X and Patriot uh, Tuesday and Wednesday. So we'll be doing the show a little bit later than we normally do, but we will still have a new Bearing Arms Cam and Company for you. Don't forget, you can subscribe to Town Hall Media on YouTube. That way you never miss a program. Also, uh, Bearing Arms Cam and Company podcast on Apple Podcasts or Stitcher or any of the fine podcast platforms. Hope that you have a fantastic rest of your Monday. Until we talk again, be well, be safe, be free. And we'll see you back here soon with another edition of Bearing Arms Cam and Company. Yeah.